Wow. Wow. Thanks for bearing with us. Many technical difficulties these last uh, couple of hours, but I think we have everything sorted. Uh, my name is Michael Marcelin, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I'm one of the technical, or one of the general co-chairs, and I'm gonna be acting as producer for the keynote today. So we have two things going on all at the same time. So we have all of you here in this room, you're going to be watching the screen as normal and uh, everything will seem exactly the same to you, but we're also live streaming. And for all of those of you who are watching this on the live stream, uh, you are uh, going to see almost the same thing as everyone here, although you'll see the PowerPoint in one window and a small picture of the speaker in another window. There's also a place for you to do Q&A. So you, can, you can't you can ask questions verbally, but you can type questions. Uh, and I will save all of those until the very end. So people who are here in the room will be able to ask questions verbally. Speaker will be able to answer those. Uh, I'll, I, I have already spoken with Yan and I've asked her to repeat the questions so that everybody out in streaming land hears them as well. And then I will also verbally ask the questions that I see typed in from streaming world. And I'll again ask Yan to repeat those and then answer the questions. And again, we're a little bit late getting started here. We've had some projector issues. Uh, we, we burned up the projector that we brought with us. They brought us a replacement projector, which is working perfectly. And then we had a cable fail and that's mostly why we're late right now, but there's a couple of other things that I don't even want to get into. Without further ado, I'll have Yuri Resnick come up and introduce our speaker. Thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it is my, uh, it is a keynote session of Data Compression Conference, and it is my enormous pleasure to introduce Dr. Yan Yi, who is the head of video standards and implementations at Alibaba Group, specifically Alibaba Cloud Intelligence Divisions that is operating in Sunnyvale, California. Uh, before uh, Alibaba, Yan was working at InterDigital and Qualcomm, and coincidentally, I worked in the same companies and we know each other since about 2006, 2007. And during all these years, I do remember Yan as a uh, rising start in international standards, video standards development communities, MPEG and VPEG, where she contributed immensely to development of uh, initially H.264 SVCs and uh, scalable extensions of HEVC, more recently VVC, nowadays neural networks based compressions beyond VVC. But today's talk of uh, uh, Jan is about something else. It's about uh, uh, feature about model based compression and uh, about things that's going to follow even beyond current paradigm of data compression, even building upon current paradigm of data compression, but trying to take it to whole next level using neural networks, using model based techniques, looking outside of the box and, and trying to compress what we see as an object, as human faces. So, with this, uh, let me introduce Ian. Thank you so much, um, Michael. Thank you, Yuri, for the nice introduction. Hello, everyone. I hope people online can hear me. Um, so today my talk is on generative face video compression promises and challenges. For uh, people know me um, as a video compression person, uh, primarily in the conventional field, uh, generative models, deep learning, all of that is uh, very new and exciting for me. So this work is a collaborative work between Alibaba and City University of Hong Kong. And I have to say I've learned a lot, a uh, very exciting journey for me. Um, so the outline of today's talk, briefly four points. Uh, first, uh, we'll talk about the background, you know, where things are in, uh, today in terms of video compression. And then I'll talk about uh, 
the generative phase video compression primarily from two perspectives. One is the promise uh, that it holds, primarily in terms of additional video compression uh, efficiency you can get out of it. Uh, but you know, it's not just promise, it's also uh, challenges. Uh, that's the second part. Uh, we'll look at uh, some challenges we have encountered while conducting this research, some attempts that we have made to solve the challenges, but there are more. Uh, so I'll talk about that in the second part and then make uh, some uh, concluding remarks. So this is a uh, block diagram that should be familiar with a lot of people uh, in the video field. It's called block-based hybrid video coding system. Uh, it has a few uh, hand-tuned modules like uh, intro prediction, inter prediction, transform quantization, uh, loop filter, uh, entropy coding. So it makes a pretty uh, important foundation uh, because it is the foundation for generations of image and video coding standards. And speaking of uh, generations of uh, standards, what we have looked at is uh, to continue to improve co coding efficiency, compression efficiency. So what we uh, have done since the early 1990s, uh, a number of, genera uh, number of uh, uh, generations, the newest one being the uh, H266 VVC, and between each two generation, uh, what we have been able to achieve is roughly cutting the bandwidth by half while maintaining similar reconstruction quality, usually me measured by human subjective viewing. So, uh, and the latest uh, is VVC, as I mentioned, it was uh, finalized in the year two, uh, 2020, and uh, Gary Sullivan gave a uh, very good keynote at DCC last year on this subject. So VVC was not the uh, was finalized about two years ago. Uh, there is continued quest for additional coding efficiency, and given the uh, success of AI technology in other fields, uh, AI-based video image and video coding is a hot topic in the academia as well as in standards committee. Uh, there are two uh, main tracks. Uh, one is uh, to enhance or replace an existing coding block within the hybrid uh, uh, coding framework. And we've seen work on intracoding, intercoding, uh, loop filtering, and so on in, along those lines. And then there's also end-to-end -end image and video compression. Here I gave you, give you two examples on the left-hand side, very famous uh, work by uh, Johannes um, Ballet and his uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, using uh, auto joint auto regressive and hyper uh, um, uh, prior to achieve learned image compression. Uh, and on the right hand side is a, a paper in 2019 uh, CVPR uh, called DVC, where the authors basically went into a, a video coding uh, framework and replaced everything with deep neural nets. That is a uh, general purpose, what I consider general purpose image and video compression. Today our topic is a little bit more focused on face video compression for particularly video chat kind of uh, application. So if we look at the video here, uh, you can see there's a lot of inherent structure uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the shape of the face, the movement, composition of different parts. So deep neural network can come in handy to learn about these. And before we dive into that, I want to mention model-based video compression. This was an active research area in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, I picked just one example, uh, a CSVT paper published in 2000, uh, where the authors used uh, parameterized 3D head model to specify the shape and appearance of a person. And then they send facial animation parameters or FAPs to specify the motion in the temporal domain. And then on the decoder side, they have um, the model-based decoder that composites and synthesize a, um, a, a reference frame and put it at for prediction of uh, predictive coding of the current video frame. So with that, let's uh, look at uh, the first part of uh, generative face video compression. 
the promise. So some related work, uh, this is a uh, paper published in 2019 uh, in NIPS uh, called FOMM, First Order Motion Model. So the authors here, they used uh, 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 a set of key points and associated affine transformations to represent motion. And then they have the source image um, coded uh, and together with the motion, that's derived from the driving video, they can synthesize, go through a generative um, module to synthesize the final output. And the application there they look at is animation of the source image, not necessarily for video compression. Uh, and last year, uh, this is uh, from Facebook uh, research team, uh, they applied the idea of FOMM towards uh, uh, talking head video compression, looking at ultra low um, uh, bandwidth. Uh, and they explored, you know, different trade off, whether the landmark or the key points are static or uh, dynamic. And also they put a lot of work towards uh, uh, optimizing the speed performance. So their uh, system actually runs real time on mobile platform, which is uh, very good uh, speed wise. And also last year, uh, very related work is uh, called from NVIDIA team, uh, Freeview Neural Talking Head Synthesis. So here, these authors, they used uh, 3D key points. Uh, so, and they also have a concept of a canonical phase uh, where the 3D key points pro provide movement relative to the canonical phase. And uh, the source image, again, contains the appearance and the driving video dictates the motion. And uh, because they use 3D key points, another quite neat feature of their system is that they can use the 3D key points to rotate the head during synthesis. So they, you, you, you could choose a different posture, slightly different posture uh, when you synthesize. So we looked at these uh, work and we thought they were very interesting. We actually, you know, uh, started by uh, duplicating their performance and looking at the the uh, uh, compression capability. Uh, one thing we uh, thought we want to explore is to can we go beyond key points? And there's a few reasons why we, we do that. First, we noticed that the key points are generally only loosely correlated with, with the facial feature. A lot of times if you visualize, you find that the key points can be, you know, appear to be randomly placed. Um, Another reason, the key points are kind of discrete, they're disjoint. So they're used to, when you derive the motion flow, they're used one by one to separately derive the motion flow and then combine together. So can you do a better job by using continuous uh, uh, fields to represent motion? And another reason, uh, this speaking as a per, uh, someone very um, intimately familiar with uh, things like VVC, uh, on the right hand side, you can see a ray distortion curve. The horizontal axis is the bit rate. The vertical axis is uh, a measure of the quality. Uh, and in this particular case, the smaller the value is, the, the better the quality. So if you look at VVC, which is the blue curve, uh, you see that it covers a wide range of um, bit rates. And as you give more bits, you actually can reconstruct a better quality uh, and you continuously go, go down on uh, vertical axis, meaning recover better quality. The um, generative uh, methods uh, here, FOMM as an example, uh, operates to the left, meaning it spends fewer bits, but it kind of struggles to go further down in the uh, vertical direction, meaning uh, reconstruction of higher quality uh, is desirable, um, but not yet uh, available. So we, uh, our work mainly aimed at uh, represent motion more efficiently and also more reliably. So the work uh, was a uh, briefly uh, discussed this morning uh, called CFTE, or, which stands for Compact Feature for Temporal Evolution. I'll uh, talk about that uh, again uh, quickly. So this is the CFTE encoder. Uh, it's uh, uh, separate a video sequence into the keyframe, which is the first frame, just VVC encoded, nothing magic there. Uh, the subsequent frames, uh, we call them interframes. Uh, we uh, extract compact features using neural nets and then send these uh, compact features over to the decoder. 
So here is the decoder diagram. It's a little bit more sophisticated than the encoder. Few steps. Uh, first, we take the bitstream, uh, uh, the compact feature from the bitstream uh, together with the keyframe uh, compact feature. We reconstruct the compact features. And then we use the compact feature to drive, derive sparse motion. And together, this sparse motion together with the down samples reconstructed keyframe go through a neural net and then we reconstruct uh, what we call coarse deformed image or coarse deformed frame. And then our uh, next stage, we take the coarse deformed, we take the compact feature, we go through another uh, dense motion estimation net and recover the dense motion and occlusion. And finally, we feed uh, dense motion occlusion and the uh, keyframe uh, into a uh, generation module to recover the final output. This is just basically equation form of what I just said, number of uh, uh, neural nets here. I won't go into details. Training, uh, someone asked about uh, Anchor, I think, uh, asked about uh, uh, training loss. Uh, so we optimized the system uh, in, in an end-to-end -end fashion. We use two categories of training losses. Uh, perceptual loss is uh, measured using VGG19, uh, and it's measured at two scales. One is between the downsampled uh, input and the coarse reconstructed, uh, coarse deformed frame. Uh, and another scale, we uh, calculate the perceptual loss at the original resolution between the input and the final output. And we also have gain loss uh, in, in the form of uh, cross entropy. And we combine these losses into total loss and train the network in end-to-end -end fashion to optimize. So uh, this is just a visualization of what happens at each stage. Uh, the keyframe uh, on the very left uh, current frame to be coded. CFTE, the compact feature, we use very compact feature, only four by four, so 16 numbers. And the coarse deformed frames as a lower resolution compared to the original resolution, dense motion, occlusion motion, finally reconstruct the uh, uh, output at uh, original scale resolution. So CFT entropy coding, very simple, nothing uh, too magic at the moment. We take the CFT map of the current frame, take the CFT map of the previous frame, calculate the residual, and then CABAC code it. I'm going to show you some experimental results. So this is our setting. Uh, we use VVC, the, the best uh, in uh, video compression uh, that we know of. Uh, VVC as our anchor, VTM10, low delay B, which is suitable for uh, video chat, uh, video conference type of application, four QP points from 37 to 52. For the generative methods, uh, same way uh, applied to the first frame, uh, the keyframe, and uh, we use, uh, in addition to our method CFTE, we have two uh, other methods, FOMM, where uh, we just take the open source model, uh, NVIDIA methods, uh, the talking head synthesis, uh, the, the authors didn't open source their uh, implementation, but there is a implementation uh, of their scheme available online, so we took that. It's called face bit to bit and uh, we also know that uh, they use key point, they send key points in the bitstream. We just modify the entropy coding of their key point coding to that to align with what we did for CFTE feature, just taking the residual and CAPEX encoding to have a fair comparison. So a set of uh, 20 test sequences, resolution 256 by 256, total uh, 10, frame, uh, 10, 10 seconds, 250 frames, and it's uh, all cropped from the open source database uh, <coughs> available in this link. And distortion metrics. Uh, so we are going to measure the uh, reconstruction, our quality using conventional metrics uh, such as PSNR and SSIM. Uh, we're also going to measure the quality using two learning-based distortion metrics. Uh, one is called LPIPS, uh, which stands for Learned Perceptual Image Patch Similarity. And the second one called DISTS, uh, which stands for Deep Image Structure and Texture Similarity. 
these are both, you know, published in well-known conferences and uh, transaction as transaction paper. Uh, all the metrics uh, are calculated using the open source implementation. So a word on another word on the distortion metrics. Um, so here I'm showing you the uh, original frame coded using VTM at QP47, coded again using VTM at QP52. So you look at all the four values. By the way, I want to mention PSNR, SSIM, the larger the better. LPIPS, DISTS, the smaller the, the better. So if you look at uh, what all these metrics are telling you, they're all telling you that the QP52 is worse. And that agrees with our perceptual uh, judgment that uh, the, uh, the, the third image is much more blurry. Completely different story when you look at generated methods. Uh, so here it's uh, using FOMM as an uh, example. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, PSNR and SSIM tell us Nah, this is bad quality. Um, uh, and, but you know, LPIPS and DISTS tell us that the quality is better compared to the previous two examples. And subjectively, I would say certainly facial feature much clearer. Um, so that's why um, uh, the reason for this, you know, generated methods do not optimize for sample level fidelity. So uh, I will evaluate coding efficiency. Um, using uh, learning base, but I will also pre present to you uh, as additional information values from PSNR and SSIM. So a busy table. Uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, the BD rate reduction, beyond our rate, uh, which measures uh, percent of rate reduction at the same quality. And the quality is measured using LPIPS, uh, the blue ones, and uh, DISTS using the, the orange ones. Uh, all the sequences are shown here. Uh, I give you two averages on the bottom. Uh, first average is the total average of all 20 sequences. And the bottom one, the very bottom average, we actually removed a few uh, exception cases. So give you a, a visualization of the exception case that I'm talking about. Take se sequence 14, for example. Uh, the BD rate tells you there's no uh, rate reduction. But if you actually look at the rate distortion curve, you see that uh, the uh, generated methods, which are the, 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 the red, the purple, and the green, are actually more efficient compared to VVC, which is the blue one. Uh, the reason why it returns zero is uh, the BD rate calculation requires an Ga uh, range overlap, uh, either in terms of bit rates or quality. And here, because there is no overlap, the uh, metric cannot calculate. So we remove these exception cases. And if we look at the uh, average on the bottom, um, we see that uh, depending on the metric uh, you look at, for FOMM, you can get, uh, compared to VVC, the anchor here, I forgot to mention it's VVC. So, uh, FOMM gives you 20 22% to 26%. Um, uh, face vid to vid gives you 50% to 57% rate reduction at the same quality. And the CFTE method gives you a uh, uh, rate, rate reduction of uh, around 68% to 70% at the same quality. So this is just a rate distortion curve uh, of all the sequences. Uh, v, uh, VVC is the blue one, and the three other colors are the generative methods. You can see that they operate much to the left of VVC curve in the uh, much lower bit rate range. So a visual comparison, uh, the original on the very left-hand side, um, and uh, the VVC, uh, this is a visualization of uh, quality at similar bit rates. So we're operating at a little more than six kilobits per second. So we see very difficult to recognize facial features, blockiness and blurriness. On the generative methods, uh, FOMM over there, uh, face vid to vid, top left, and CFT bottom, uh, top right and bottom, and bottom right. So uh, they give you better quality. Uh, uh, PSNR, of course, worse than uh, uh, VVC, VVC, you know, according to PSNR, produced the best quality. Uh, but uh, the other two 
learning-based metrics tell you that uh, the generating methods are better, uh, which tend to agree with the subjective um, quality. I want to also mention that uh, please pay attention to the lips. Um, the generative methods actually cannot move the lips. Uh, that point will come back a little bit later, much later in the talk. Um, this is just the RD curve of, uh, of what we just saw. So another example at around a uh, little bit more than five kilobits per second. This video again, v VBC is uh, very blocky and blurry. Uh, generative methods are better um, uh, in terms of uh, the LPIPS and DISTS. You see a big reduction also subjectively. It's not some perfect. You can see generative methods uh, that uh, where the background moves somewhat with the person, uh, but uh, overall better quality. Uh, this is just the RD curve. Uh, this is another way to look to compare uh, similar quality, uh, similar quality metric value uh, in LPIPS and DISTS, uh, but the bit rate is quite different. So VBC to achieve this kind of quality, you need to uh, spend 18 more than 18 kilobits per second. Uh, generative methods much lower, and uh, for CFTE you spend 18% uh, of VVC bit rate uh, to achieve uh, quite similar uh, visual quality. This is just the rate distortion curve. Uh, another example, also similar quality, um, uh, but different bit rates. So VVC here is spending 11 kilobits per second, and uh, you know three generative methods gradually re de uh, decrease the, uh, the number of bits. Uh, but uh, the CFTE is uh, spending 23%. Uh, that's less than a quarter of the VVC bit rate to achieve uh, very similar quality. The rate distortion curve of what we just saw. So uh, we look at a uh, little bit deeper uh, what's sent uh, for the three generative methods. So for FOMM, uh, you send 10 key points. Uh, they're all uh, 2D key points and the associated 2 by 2 Jacobian. Uh, phase bit to bit uh, sends 15 key points. They're three dimensional and some parameters to, uh, for expression and translation movement. And for CFTE, we send very compact, only 16 numbers uh, from the feature map. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, percent of the bit, bit, uh, bit stream that's occupied by these things, um, CFT actually does give you lower bit rate overhead. That's why you can see the, the, the uh, rate distortion curve is most uh, moved most to the left, uh, if you recall. So that's the, the promise on uh, the ability to operate with much reduced bit rate to recover clearer, better facial feature. But now we're going to look at some challenges. So the first challenge is uh, ch challenge of larger motion. So this example, you see the original is um, the person is moving his head left to right, bigger range of movement. And all three generated methods now kind of starts to generate some distortion, motion uh, distortion, uh, ghosting, and unpleasant. So in order to solve this, uh, we borrow the page from the conventional scheme called dynamic uh, reference refresh. So it's actually rather simple. Uh, in the current scheme, only the first frame is coded as keyframe. So here we say, OK, you have a sequence. As you code each frame, you compare the CFTE map between the keyframe and what you want to code. And if the difference is too large, you think you need to generate another keyframe or reference frame. So you use EBVC to code it put it in your buffer, um, and you can do that for another frame in the sequence. And then when you finally code the current frame, you go into the uh, list you have and look for the one that's the most appropriate to be used. Um, while we borrow that page from the conventional playbook, we also notice that the conventionally you can do uh, multi-hypothesis prediction, you know, for example, by prediction, have two prediction signal. So we can do the same here. Uh, we did the same here, actually. You know, we apply the, the CFTE uh, flow 
to uh, two times on two reference and generate some um, two predictions and we use apply a, a neural net a fusion network to uh, fuse the two into one final output. So this is the rate distortion curve uh, of all the sequences we just talked about uh, uh, collectively. The purple curve is dynamic CFTE where we incorporated the two schemes we just talked about. Compared to the plain vanilla CFTE, you can see that uh, uh, it has a little bit more gain, um, better, uh, better rate distortion performance. Another thing is uh, you actually see, if you look at the, the bottom part, the uh, dynamic scheme can extend the operation range towards higher quality, and that's what was lacking uh, when we first observed uh, generate, look at generated methods. So this is just a visual comparison. The same, you know, uh, example I just gave you: person moving his head. Uh, the the bottom right uh, figure is the dynamic and multi-reference scheme. Uh, you know, now the the motion distortion is gone. It's still not perfect. There is a, some flickering, uh, but we're operating at uh, rate very very low, four kilobits per second. And compared to VVC, uh, it's um, much better in terms of facial clarity. Another example, larger movement of the head. Uh, again, if you don't do the dynamic refresh, uh, you kind of uh, have all sorts of uh, motion artifacts. Uh, but with the dynamic uh, scheme, you can fix that and uh, uh, keep the motion going, also maintain the facial feature. Uh, another challenge we noticed, so far everybody has been com compressing 256 by 256. So even for f like video chat, that's not enough. It's like a little tiny thumbnail. Uh, we want to adapt to larger resolution. Uh, so how do you do it? Um, the most simple way, just forget about it. Uh, and apply pre post-processing. Do the coding at uh, core coding at uh, small scale, but you know down sample and up up sample before and after. So that's one way. Resize. Another way, actually, neural nets are quite good at uh, down sampling and up sampling based on academic research. So it's actually quite easy to just absorb the uh, down sampling and up sampling operation within the workflow, add a few layers to have everything fit. So this is the um, uh, performance um, of um, uh, different resolutions. Just for simplicity, I'm only showing you DISTS, but LPIPS, very similar, uh, uh, very, very similar observation. Um, we experimented with uh, 384 by 384, 512 by 512, 640 by 640. Not quite uh, HD, but standard de uh, definition range. We can operate. Um, Again, I'm giving you all 20 sequences, the grand total, which is the second to last row, uh, but uh, it's more uh, relevant to look at uh, the, the very bottom row where we remove some exception cases where the beyond the uh, delta rate fails to give you a reasonable number. For example, it's saying in this case, there is no rate reduction, but if you look at the rate distortion curve, clearly the uh, generated methods are better than VBC. So we remove those from our calculation, and if we observe the trend, we see that the resize uh, BD rate, rate reduction capability as you go up in resolution, it starts to go down. But the adaptive methods, where you absorb the up and down sample inside of the workflow, you see that not only does it hold, it actually increases uh, compared to the VVC anchor. So this is just the rate distortion in the rate distortion curve uh, form. So the yellow curve is when you do resize, the green curve is when you do adaptive. And we can see that uh, if you don't, if you resize as, as you go up in resolution, the, uh, you have a problem of uh, struggling farther and farther, uh, struggling more and more to reach the good quality range, um, but the adaptive method can keep the uh, performance robust, at least relative to VVC. Uh, so this is visual comparison. Uh, we're operating at around four uh, kilobits per second, 
at larger resolution, um, 384 by 384. Uh, resize a little bit blurry. I hope it shows up on your side. Uh, 512 uh, by 512, um, less than seven kilobits per second. Um, the facial feature well preserved using adaptive CFTE, VVC kind of blocky and blurry. Uh, 640 by 640, same story, uh, further blurring if you use resize and adaptive uh, CFT is, um, holds up the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the details better. So last challenge, but a very significant challenge is uh, complexity. So we know the conventional codecs are widely deployed in the industry. It's on your phone, on your computer, on your TV, on many, many devices. Um, reasonable complexity. But generative methods, uh, right now, I'm just giving you all three generative methods um, that we used encoder, decoder, uh, measured in terms of number of parameters, uh, network parameters, uh, max per pixel, uh, these are related to computation complexity, and then the inference speed. So if you look at uh, what we used, it's a pretty powerful ser uh, server inferencing 256 by 256 video, and we don't quite have real time. We haven't, uh, of course, we haven't, unlike the Facebook team uh, who has put a lot of effort into optimizing speed, we have so far mainly look at performance, uh, we do care greatly about complexity. Our work is not targeted just for academic research. We really want to apply it to real-world applications. So this is something that will uh, hopefully, you know, uh, be able to address in our future research. So I will just conclude my talk. Um, uh, what we have seen in this talk, uh, we have uh, hopefully shown that uh, generative face video compression has shown much promise. Uh, it can preserve better uh, facial feature at very, very low bit rates. Um, that VVC is struggling. Uh, and uh, we can also have significant uh, delta uh, BD rate reduction compared to VVC, the best we have, uh, the best video coding standard we have. Uh, also, uh, we haven't shown that part, but um, NVIDIA showed that you can do uh, face composition using this type of methods, uh, which brings us closer to the metaverse. Um, but it also has many, many challenges. Uh, we look at uh, how to avoid uh, distortions, motion distortions, um, but uh, we need to look broader and make sure there are no uh, uh, bad cases, especially if you want to do uh, real world application. Um, we also need to remember uh, to continue to work towards being able to achieve higher quality reconstruction. I, if you remember, I mentioned the uh, one in one example, the lady's lip could not move. Uh, so we want to look at uh, how to move, uh, represent expression better, you know, how to represent local motion better. Uh, also, of course, the complexity reduction is a big task we need to look at. So these are the challenges. Also for generally for neural network or AI based um, video compression uh, schemes, uh, we need to expand uh, beyond head and shoulder. What I have shown is mainly head and shoulder scenario. We need to expand beyond that, um, be able to find ways to compress uh, video, uh, you know, general purpose uh, sense, achieve high performance at the same time. And also I think, um, one very important lesson we have learned uh, is uh, if we want to do that, we really need to start looking at quality metrics that are beyond PSNR and SSIM. Uh, maybe, uh, for example, uh, learning-based uh, quality metrics, because otherwise the learning um, uh, net, neural nets-based uh, video compression will have uh, uh, even more uh, struggle. So I want to uh, acknowledge my collaborators, uh, really learned a lot from them. Dr. Shiti Wang uh, from City University of Hong Kong, Dr. Zhao Wang in uh, Alibaba, my colleague, 
uh, two wonderful PhD students, Paulin and uh, Binjo. Thank you all for working together on this. And a uh, set of references and uh, any questions? Yes. Ah, the question is, uh, why did I say neural network based video compression has a difficult time? Uh, we have looked at, uh, uh, let, me, let me just take the, the uh, video standards committee, uh, what we have looked at, right? We have looked at uh, neural nets to enhance or replace a coding tool extensively. And you, you can get gain, okay? You can get up to, even measured by PSNR, you can get up to 10% coding efficiency, okay, by using neural network to do in-loop filter, okay? But the struggle we have there is performance. Sorry, speed performance, complexity. Complexity versus performance trade-off, right? So that one module will roughly, okay, roughly, very roughly occupy the same area as a whole codec if you implement it in hardware, right? So that is a big complexity. If you are looking at putting that on your phone, on every device, which is you know, what the standards committee does, we have to take that into consideration. So we haven't, we, we haven't given up. We actually don't want to give up. Uh, we continue to look for ways to find better complexity versus performance trade-off. And we're still continuing to do that, okay? So, but that is a challenge that we're facing at the moment, right? So how do you, uh, how do you justify 10% with a very large hardware burden? And of course, also software burden, right? So, so those are the, the things, uh, I think, um, uh, the challenges that we need to solve. Yeah, Johannes. Okay. The, yeah, the question is uh, a specific one. Uh, we look at uh, uh, the quality metrics. We use our LPIPS, LPIPS or DISTS. Um, um, and why did we not use face classifier uh, uh, type of uh, metrics? I, I think the answer is uh, we didn't know <laughs> uh, which ones to use. Uh, the, uh, these two are pretty um, well known to us, so we, we, we use them, we've seen other people use them as well, um, but uh, I'll be happy to learn more from you what other uh, more proper. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I probably that that's a good idea. Well, you know, most likely try that uh, next, and I'll probably be in touch regarding, you know, which ones you recommend. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. Correct. Yeah. Let me look for that. I think you were talking about a pretty early. Yeah, it's very early. Yeah, it's not in the challenging part. It's uh, further up. Yeah. So let's see if we can uh, play this while we. Okay. Yeah. 
yeah, 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 yeah. So okay, so uh, for remote uh, uh, folks on the uh, on the streaming, the question is uh, regarding this example. Um, uh, VVC captured hand movement, but the generative methods basically just completely uh, ignored it. Uh, I think it could be, depending on how you look at it, um, it's probably a feature, <laughs> right? Um, it, it is a bug that we, it is a feature of the currency system. Uh, it is a bug uh, that we need to solve. Uh, this is uh, related to in the challenges part, right? In my conclusion, I think we did see in other examples where small local motion, the generative methods are struggling to um, regenerate. Now, we are always operating so far very, if you look at the RD curve, it's like almost like a vertical line, right? You spend hardly more, right? But can you spend more bits to capture better quality? That is something that we definitely are very interested in looking at. Uh, if you want to broaden the use, right? The, the ability to, as you go up in bit rate, to gradually, progressively reproduce a more and more uh, 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 fa um, faithfully, reproduce the content more faithfully is a, um, is a big challenge in my view, right? We've made some improvements in the dynamic refresh, but it's just a first try. There are more things we should do, right? Is it, can we go up in resolution? Do we always stick with a four by four, for example, right? Is that going to solve the problem or do we need to do other things? Um, those are, you know, future directions to be, to be looked at. Yeah. Michael? Yeah. Okay. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So the question is uh, how the keyframes are coded and what percentage of bit rate went into that. The keyframes are coded using VVC, VTM10, specifically at four QPs that are exactly the same as the VVC anchor, uh, 37 to 52 delta QP of five. Uh, the percentage of bit rate is shown here. So what I'm showing you, by, uh, QP52, QP42, QP32. Um, and uh, the percentage here represents the CFTE map, for example, right? The right uh, column is CFTE map. And 100% subtract uh, these numbers is what the VVC keyframe is occupying. So in the CFTE case, VVC is occupying 24 to 51 to 73% of the bitstream. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I have a question about, is it, does it make sense, for example, to use uh, these uh, sort of generated, uh, sort of animated uh, frames as intrapredictors or interpredictors, or sort of having some type of hybrid codec? And you, you could sort of approach the low, higher quality regions doing that, I'm assuming. But I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the question is, uh, can we use the generative method to enhance or complement the uh, the uh, existing framework rather than hybrid yeah hybrid just um, yeah complement or add on or you know um, I think that is similar to somewhat to the model based um, compression where they generate synthesize and put it as an additional reference frame right so. I think, yeah, I think that's, you know, certainly something we can try to kind of have this uh, sitting on the sideline, generate a reference frame, you know, do something similar to the model compression, model-based compression paper. Um, uh, one dilemma, if we go in that direction that I can think of is again, if we tag along the conventional framework, right? Then people are going to say, okay, how do you compare uh, complexity versus performance, right? And uh, that's similar to the loop filter uh, uh, situation we have, right? So certainly it gives good gain. We like 10% gain. With other methods, you cannot get 10% gain. But then the, the thing is like, you know, you have a codec, 
you know, that's occupying however many, you know, hardware gates. And now you need to duplicate that to just to get 10%. So if we do something like that, we will also get into that situation. Now, maybe we can try that. And maybe if we can get 50% gain, that will change people's mind. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like I have a smaller module. So if you, the, the experience that I have had or the kind of at least the thought process that has been happening in my brain, in my mind is, you know, as long as we kind of do together with a conventional framework, we would always need to really cut the, cut the module, uh, cut the net uh, network into like smaller pieces and still maintain the performance. And then so that it could sit together with these conventional signal processing schemes, which are much simpler. You know, they're mostly linear, for example, right? So the operation there is a lot simpler. Uh, so you have to do that. On the other hand, the end-to-end -end paradigm, it's like, you know, it, it's just a newer network. Maybe you just forget about the, the uh, hardware you had before. Just you have MPU, maybe just drive the MPU to do that. Right, because they're particularly designed for neural networks. So I think the jury is still out. Yeah, it's uh, active research. Um, what finally works uh, remains to be seen. Yes? Uh, so I noticed that uh, the BBC seems to be uh, disentangling the motion from stationary much better, like the uh, background wasn't moving. Yes, properly. absolutely. So mm -hmm. what do you think like the state of uh, Optical flow, motion estimation, local and global neural networks is in that in all these neural network based. Uh, Let me understand the question. The question is uh, BBC produces a better uh, uh, background, right? Because it it actually also moves the background when the 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 um, the rates are very low, um, but uh, uh, mostly it's better uh, in in those area. And the question is, um, can we do instead of a total generative methods, complement the motion prediction using optical flow method methodology within within BBC? Yeah. Uh, so the answer is certainly yes. Actually, BBC has some you know uh, flavor of optical flow um, in the motion prediction, um, but of course much simplified because again you know you cannot have. Uh, overly complicated uh, uh, motion in there. Uh, I think there are, uh, I don't recall the specific numbers, but I believe there are uh, papers, recent papers that, you know, use the neural nets to come up with optical flow and then, you know, use that to, to, to uh, produce prediction. Uh, um, they can get some gain on um, three percentage gain. Um, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, again, it's a takes us back to the question complexity versus performance. So yeah, so I think uh, if we can cut the neural nets operation and still maintain that three percent, people will welcome that for sure. Yeah. And I noticed that we're really out of time, so I don't know. Um, you caused that, okay. <laughs> so I saw two hands, I think, here and then you, uh, and then maybe we can uh, take everything offline. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, uh, in terms of, again, along the lines of background moving together with the foreground, the question is whether we can just segment it out and uh, only work on the foreground and, you know, have the backgrounds be still. Uh, and that would solve the problem. I, I think conceptually, absolutely. And practically, that should also be a direction that we pursue. Uh, actually, I was <laughs> planning to do that anyway. Yeah, because... Um, if you apply the generative method, unless the neural nets can kind of recognize which parts to move and which parts not to, um, you know, relying on segmentation is maybe one way to go. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. Uh, 
Oh, uh, yeah, I think uh, so. Oh, yeah, the question is uh, why do we not go into lower QP, right? So the lower QP, um, uh, for example, you can certainly do QP 22. That will give you a very good uh, um, uh, uh, reconstruction. You know, I wouldn't say transparent, but, you know, pretty high quality. I think you would be very happy with the quality that you see at QP 22. Uh, I don't think that's a problem to be solved. To be honest, in my view, uh, the conventional methods, remember the generations of video coding standards, right? They solve those problems quite well already, in my view. Uh, and uh, maybe there are other neural network based technology that are particularly targeted at uh, uh, high quality range, so to speak. But this is this type of technology, I don't think is the the um, solution for addressing the higher quality uh, bit rate reduction. Uh, so that's why, you know, this is more like uh, something that uh, we uh, focus on the, the lower uh, reduced bit rate, ultra low rate uh, communication area, yeah, operation range, yeah. You could um, certainly throw more bits into the keyframe, right, code it using 22 and then you, you apply generative method. I, I, I think that's certainly doable, yeah. Um, but then you would somewhat run into the situation of uh, saturation in terms of uh, uh, you just cannot move the quality even further uh, toward the higher range, uh, to, toward the higher quality range. Remember the curve I was showing that uh, kind of, you know, struggles to, uh, with LPIPS, which is lower the better, it kind of struggles to dip further down. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think, for example, the bigger problems like, uh, uh, like uh, motion distortion or inability to to move local parts are still there, regardless of your first frame QP. Yeah, based on our experience. Okay. Okay. All right, then. Thank you, everybody, for listening.